Welcome to Where I'm From, the podcast that proves no matter how far you go, you'll always keep a little piece of home with you. I'm Bill Meeks. This week, Rebecca Johnson, fan podcaster and communications specialist for the University of Alabama Museums, joins me to talk about where she's from, Birmingham, Alabama. Or I think it might be Birmingham. Stay tuned to find out why there ain't no ham like Birmingham. You might know Rebecca Johnson as one of the hosts of Supergirl Radio, a podcast devoted to the CW Supergirl series and ancillary media that she started in 2015. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Noyce, and you're listening to Supergirl Radio. McGurk! I love not typing. Not messing with my Google Docs, Meeksy. Supergirl Radio is going live every night of the week. How do you like it? Rebecca's also worked in media for a number of years, as she explains in this clip from my still unreleased documentary, One Week in March. There. So I've worked there for 14 years. I worked for Turner Classic Movies and Cartoon Network and Adult Swim and TBS and TNT and did some things for Boomerang and CNN. And um, so I got to touch a lot of cool entertainment uh, television and got to learn a lot about the television industry. Uh, Just recently, within the last six, seven months, I moved back to Birmingham, Alabama to be closer to my family. Rebecca left Turner and Atlanta in 2019 to return to where she's from, creating content for the University of Alabama Museums. And I noticed that uh, in the area where my Canada geese friends hang out, uh, there are a lot of feathers. Birmingham, or Birmingham, was considered the center of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, mostly due to the connection Martin Luther King Jr. had to the community. Birmingham also played an important part in my story. You see, Rebecca co-starred with me on my serialized comedy podcast, The Fakest, One Last Day, and I used elements of Rebecca's backstory for her character, Leanne Snyder. After college, I went to work for my hometown station, WAFM TV3 in Birmingham, Alabama. My first day on the job, I met Jerry Springer. Today, I'll ask Rebecca what it was like growing up in Birmingham, why she left to pursue a media career in Atlanta, and what drew her back years later. Okay, let's talk to Rebecca. And welcome to where I'm from, Rebecca Johnson. How are you doing, Rebecca? Hey, Bill, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me on. Hi, uh, no problem. I mean, I, I kind of had to, right? I think I think you've been involved <laughs> in some way or another in almost every podcasting thing I have ever, ever done. So, you know, it has to be, right? <laughs> well, I always try to squeeze myself in there somewhere. <laughs> but I've also had you in some of the things that I've done. So uh, I guess it goes both ways. Absolutely. Maybe maybe uh, not quite as uh, often on Supergirl Radio lately as I would like. But, you know, well, we okay. can make that happen. We can change that up. Meek Chess uh could make another appearance if he wanted to. He's uh, right <laughs> here behind me. So, yeah, he's just waiting in the wings. Well, uh, how's uh, how's Birmingham doing tonight? It's great. Actually, right before I came to talk to you, I was down at the Birmingham Museum of Art at their Star Wars night. So they had some Star Wars themed activities, uh, some art activities, which I couldn't figure out. It involved a stencil and some sort of black felt. And I was like, I don't know how to do this. (laughs) Um, But they also had some uh, James Webb telescope stuff down there. Um, So it was a a cool night. So I I try to indulge in some of those uh, Birmingham things uh, when I can. So that was a fun uh, evening. So I I just happened to indulge in some Birmingham things right before I spoke with you. And that's kind of why we have you on the show, too, because if nothing else, uh, I know, you know, education in Birmingham because, you know, that's your, that's your gig. That's your main gig. I've, uh, I've been around it a long time. I was not born in Birmingham. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, and we moved to Birmingham when I was two. So I've mm-hmm. really only known Birmingham, uh, except for the 14 years I was in Georgia. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I've been a, a Birmingham, Alabama girl for most of my life. Functionally from Birmingham. Yes, yes. <laughs> Rebecca, um, I I know you went to high school in the Birmingham area. You went to college in the Birmingham area. Were there any teachers that really sort of inspired you or sort of set you on a path to what you're doing now? Well, I have to clarify two things. So I um, so Birmingham is actually there's downtown Birmingham, which most people think of as Birmingham. And then there are these suburbs that are outside of downtown Birmingham. And so one of those is the place where I grew up. So Mm -hmm. if if I if I uh, wrote you a letter and I put Rebecca Johnson's address, Birmingham, Alabama, 
it would still uh, be a, the correct address. But yeah. what I would normally put would be Vestavia Hills, Alabama. So that mm. was the place where I actually grew up uh, from the time I was two years old until I went off to college, which was in Tuscaloosa, not Birmingham. Ah. So Vestavia Hills, and I don't know how it's like today. I know that they're doing some new things to the high school, which I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Uh-huh. Um, but when I was growing up there, I felt a little out of sorts because mm-hmm. it was a wealthier um, part of Birmingham. A lot of kids that I knew d- drove really nice cars. I had a Chevy Lumina, which was a big tank of a boat of a car. And I didn't even get that until I was a senior in high <laughs> school. And uh, so a lot of the, a lot of the kids had wealthy families, big houses. Uh, my, ha- my house where I grew up was a, a smaller house uh, compared to the mansions up the street for me. My dad Uh, worked five jobs. My mom was a teacher. You know, it was like there were things that uh, that didn't didn't make me sort of fit in with some of the other kids in my school. So uh, naturally, I was a a band nerd. I was a band geek. So (laughs) so I sort of that was my crew. I I I wasn't with the the popular kids or the, you know, the athletes, the cheerleaders, the, you know, the people who had the big parties and the big houses. I I was hanging out with the band, the band nerds. And that was totally fine with me. But but Vestavia is a, a wealthier area, but it also, uh, to my great, I guess, pride about Vestavia is that um, a very good education. Uh, we had uh, a very famous, well-known, uh, successful math and debate teams. Uh, my brother also went to Vestavia Hills High School, and he was a uh, national Lincoln Douglas finalist, which oh, is wow. a pretty, pretty high up in the chain for debate. I was <laughs> I tried debate once uh, for a year. I was not that great. So I quit. So I was like, I guess my brother's the debater. I will be in the band. That's <laughs> fine. He quit band. So I guess we balanced uh, <laughs> everything out. Um, but we had we had some really strong academic things. We had uh, my senior year, we had a uh, uh, state championship football team. You know, we mm-hmm. had a lot of trophies, which Vestavia was very proud of. Um, so it was a wealthier area, but um, but there were were some kids like me that you know had to work a little harder for things and, yeah. and didn't get some of those things. So, um, but I but I loved Vestavia. I had a really good education. When I got to college, I realized that the things I learned in high school, some of the other kids maybe didn't learn, like <laughs> how to write an essay or you know yeah, yeah. how to do certain things, you know, how to write a paper, how to write a term paper. Those were sort of basic things I had done my whole high school career in the some kids when I got to college had no idea how to do that. So I am very grateful for my time at Vestavia Hills. And um, I I always thought it was a good school system, uh, but it it was an interesting experience in terms of some of the the things that the other kids had. Yeah. Yeah. I went to a a larger high school. So, I mean, there were rich kids and poor. There was a pretty wide divide. You know, there were the people who lived down on the island, you know, who might be on welfare their parents might not have a car that sort of thing and then there were people who lived up on renaissance way up in bethlehem (laughs) that sounds nice who you know lived it lived in a mansion and because of the nature of the school uh there would always be a lot of mixing in the classes of these different economic areas you know oh yeah uh you know as you got older into the upper class and stuff you know it would kind of split off because these people would go on like the the shop track and these people would go on the theater track or the academic track or whatever. Did you ever have any moments where you saw those sort of class barriers break down? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, When you first started that question, I was thinking about how my friend Clay was the basketball team's manager. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, his family wasn't a rich family either. Like we we kind of, you know, middle class families or whatever. And I remember he was telling me a story about how he went to one of the one of the popular kids, uh, rich family. His dad was like some sort of brain surgeon or something. I don't remember what (laughs) medical field he was in, but he had a huge house and he lived. This guy lived near me. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I knew which house it was. And my friend Clay was telling me, like, yeah, I got invited to a party because he was with the basketball team. So he yeah. he went, he would get up in that house and he got to see what it looked like inside. And I remember being <laughs> so jealous, like, what did it look like? <laughs> so I remember those kinds of sometimes things would 
mix a little bit where I guess that kind of did break down just because Clay had, you know, been such a, a faithful member of the basketball team. And so he was sort of accepted in because of that. Um, so he got to take a look behind the curtain. That reminds me of, uh, you know, because I got involved in theater the last couple of years of high school. And when we would have cast parties at the end of the show, they would be over at one of the other people's house. And I would just it would be like a mansion. Like there'd be like this big underground bunker, indoor pool, all this stuff. Oh I was gosh. like, man, like, you know, we have like a 300 square foot house for 50 people. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, I have to say the guy who lived in that fancy, big, huge mansion house uh, I ran into him when I was in Atlanta. I went to an SEC championship game because the University of Alabama was playing in it. And I just happened to see him in this like gift shop that was there in the stadium. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think he would know me, remember me. But he said, hey, to me, we had a conversation. He was <laughs> perfectly nice. So it wasn't to say that all the rich kids were snobs or something like that. Um, yeah. But uh, but it, it was just interesting, you know, after we had grown up and and gone our, our ways and our paths in life. It, it's just interesting when that happens, when you kind of run into somebody so, so much after so much time has passed and kind of see what they're like now. So that was it was kind of yeah. interesting. I, I remember the last time I, w I was living back in my hometown, I ran into my first girlfriend and it because it, I was like back in town for a few months and I was delivering pizza and she <laughs> happened to come in to get a pizza while I was there delivering it. And I was like, oh, man, of course it's like <laughs> <laughs> when I'm at my lowest. <laughs> <she shows up. laughs> All right. So, uh, Rebecca, when I reached out to you about being on the show today, uh, you ta mentioned you wanted to talk about the City Stages Music Festival in Birmingham, which what happened, I believe, over Father's Day weekend for yeah, around 30 years or so. It's been a busy weekend so far in the Magic City with City Stages taking over downtown Birmingham. We want to walk through some of the acts that have been there so far. Sure. With Sean Kingston, how did he go? How did his, his performance go Friday? He was great. He was he was brief because he actually uh, he showed up a little late. But uh, <laughs> maybe the, the rain uh, delayed him. Too. I think the rain did delay him, but uh, he was wonderful. The crowd loved him. They went wild. Why don't you go ahead and explain to the listeners uh, what it was and why you kind of fell in love with it and miss it? City Stages was a music festival that would take place in downtown Birmingham. And by the time I had been getting, you know, I went to college and was still going to City Stages, it had gotten quite big. There were a lot of stages um, and you could go and listen to different kinds of music. You could hang out. You could get, you know, food at some of the vendors. And it was just a place where people gathered and you could um, hear a lot of bands. There were some big names. Bonnie Raitt was there. John Mayer was there. I remember going to hear Edie Burkell because <laughs> I love Edie Burkell and the New Bohemians. Oh, my gosh. I love Edie Burkell. Um, and uh, so I, I also remember going to see Nelly. The, the time that Nelly was there, I I felt like I was in danger because we <laughs> heard gunshots at some point. And Ooh. I was like, OK, that's it's time to go. Yeah. Um, but I do remember that was the uh, I don't remember Nelly performing. I just <laughs> remember going to try to see Nelly and hearing the gunshots. That's what I remember. And the gunshots um, and running. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the gunshot was part of the performance, I guess. I don't know. Um, one of the things I really remember about uh, City Stages was going to see Cameo. Uh, do, you, do you know of the band Cameo? They're very famous for the song Word Up. Uh, yeah, Word Up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. W-O-R-D <laughs> Up. I love that song so much. And I was the only person in my group of friends who was like, we are going to see Cameo play. I don't care what else y'all do. I am going to see Cameo play. So I remember going to City Stages when I was a teenager, when I was in high school, and a couple of years into college. And I just really loved it. It was a great downtown experience. It, I was a huge music fan then, and there was a lot to see. And I just remember gathering there and just, I mean, you could sit on the grass and just have a good time and listen to the music. And I do remember having, aside from the Nelly gunshot thing, <laughs> I remember having really good memories of it, you know, hanging out with my friends. You could buy a weekend pass and go every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a, a very, uh, I have fond memories of that. But as I later discovered when I had moved to Atlanta and I had heard they're not doing city stages anymore, I was like, why are they not doing city stages? <laughs> Apparently, they uh, had financial troubles. <laughs> uh, so it sounded like maybe they could not uh, afford it anymore or they had gotten into debt. Maybe mm -hmm. some of those uh, big names and all those stages maybe cost a little too much money and they couldn't handle it anymore. But I'm, I'm so sad that that 
is lost in the Birmingham experience now yeah. because there's no, I don't know of another musical, a music festival that's like that. And so mm-hmm. I, I just, I have good memories of it and I, I'm kind of sad it's gone. I, I really think you need to uh, just uh, charge up uh, to Birmingham City Hall with your ukulele and be like, I'm going to put on the new city stage with starring Rebecca Johnson. And they'll be like, OK, uh, you set up your own stage. We'll <laughs> give you a permit. Nobody will show up. <laughs> you mentioned that you really like the Alabama theater. I was look, doing some research on it. Looks like it was built in 1927 by Paramount Studios. It's still in operation today as a movie theater and entertainment venue. Correct. Yes. Well, since you told me you wanted to talk about it, let's talk. Why Why don't we start here? Uh, tell me about the first time you went there. Uh, the first time I remember being there, which may not be the first time I went there, but I was probably a sophomore in high school. I remember that my friend Cheryl had called me up saying, hey, would you want to go down to the Alabama Theater and watch Gone with the Wind with uh, her then boyfriend, Matt, and her? (laughs) And I was so young that I didn't realize what I had been roped into. This was basically just a way so that uh, the parents didn't think anything was going on Uh, uh, with the two of them. I was kind of the shield, and I didn't realize I was being used at the time. But I was like, sure, I'll go down and see a movie. I take that back. That might have been eighth grade. It might have been middle school. I've totally been in that position. Uh, I get invited to my... Uh, sister's boyfriend's house to play video games. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's really just so they can see each other. And I'm the chaperone, but not really. Yeah, yeah. I I was extremely used that day. But that was the first time I saw Gone with the Wind. And it was the full deal with the intermission and everything. And we sat up in the balcony because, of course, Mm -hmm. with with, uh, Cheryl and her boyfriend. I will not name names. (laughs) But uh, I probably should have changed her name to protect the innocent. Uh, (laughs) But it's already happened. Cheryl's been called out. But uh, we sat up in the balcony. And it's just such a beautiful place inside. They did a lot of renovation to it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, I I think it's like a... uh, a wonderfully uh, preserved place inside. And I have a, I have a soft spot for old movie theaters. I, I just yeah. love them. I wish I could go to more of them. I would make a documentary about them. I love them. The grandeur um, and the velvet curtains. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, that Jim stuff. Carrey movie called The Majestic. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing. That is an unsung classic. Yes. Like, minus the 30 seconds where Jim Carrey's crying and he looks like the mask. Like, I mean, it's a perfect <laughs> movie. <laughs> If I could have like uh, people, people sometimes ask me, what's your dream job? And I'll, I'll be like, well, I wish I was Tina Fey or I could be a head writer on a soap opera. Or That's all <laughs> a lie. I wish that I could own and operate an old movie theater. That would be actually the dream um, mm-hmm. because that that would be so fun. But but I remember having a uh, despite being used by my friends, <laughs> um, I had a really good experience there and I enjoyed it was a different thing. It wasn't just going to, you know, the regular movie theater. It was some different place and it had a different feel to it it made you feel like you were in the past and so that was my first experience and they do a lot of uh summer movies like that so that would have been a summer movie gone with the wind which is four hours long so (laughs) it's a time commitment it came on like four vhs tapes back in the day it's a monster it's a crazy long movie but um the summer movies they'll do movies in the summer and then they do movies during christmas so I, I like especially try to go to the ones during Christmas. Uh, I saw a Christmas vacation there last year. Um, and so that's a, a really fun time. They decorate the theater and, you know, Christmas decorations. And I also recently saw a concert there. So they do concerts. They do plays. I saw a play when I was in high school there. I, I should add there is a uh, an organ there. Ooh. There is a pipe organ at the Alabama Theater. It, I think I looked it up. It's a Wurlitzer Opus 1783. So it's a pipe oh, wow. organ that comes out of the floor and it pops mm-hmm. up. And so they use it to do sing-alongs during Christmas time for Christmas carols. And uh, I'm in, in a couple of days, I'm actually going to go see the Phantom of the Opera silent film there. Uh, at the Alabama Theater. And so I imagine the pipe organ may be used for that as well to to fill in the music for that. I've never seen a silent film in the proper silent film uh, format. So I'm excited to yeah. see that. So they, they do so many really unique and fun things that you wouldn't be able um, to get there. So I, I really, I really love the Alabama theater so much. And uh, probably uh, partially it's set up to do all that stuff because like I said, in my research, Paramount funded it back in the day. So <laughs> back, you know, 
uh, before the talkies and stuff, the way they would distribute films is they would send out a film canister and they'd send out sheet music. And hmm. you'd always have a live performer sitting there performing the ding, 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 <laughs> yeah, as Charlie yeah. Chaplin was chasing yeah, yeah, a horse yeah. down the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've had to do a lot of fundraising and they have people who are very, in Birmingham, they have a lot of people who are very passionate about the Alabama theater. And um, mm-hmm. I, was a, I was a member of the Alabama theater. Um, so I, I think that there are a lot of people who don't want it to die. It's a landmark in Birmingham. And so uh, everybody really wants to make sure it's taken care of so it can keep going. Being, being a young artist in uh, Birmingham, did you ever have an opportunity to actually perform there? Like, Because I, I know you've done music and stuff. Yeah, I was in the band. So I played bassoon and clarinet, but we never performed there. Mm. I have some friends who have performed there. Uh, the only time I ever did anything artsy was that I uh, <laughs> I shot and edited a video for a friend of mine who wanted to propose to his girlfriend in a very special way. So his plan Ooh. was that he was going to make this music video uh, with a song that he wrote and performed. And then I was going to help him make this video, this music video to be played at the Alabama theater. So I actually had something screened at the Alabama theater. I may not have played (laughs) my bassoon there. Have I told you you were amazing? And how I can't wait to see you again. Have I told you how beautiful you are and how long I've been waiting for to love to begin? So, so he played the video over the screen there. And then after it was over, he proposed to his girlfriend. So all of his friends and family were there. And so it was kind of a, a cool thing. So I actually oh, yeah. had a video of mine that I shot and edited screened at the Alabama theater. And there was an audience there to watch it. So that's actually <laughs> uh, pretty cool. Folks, uh, we do have to take a quick break here uh, to take a word from our sponsor, uh, but we're going to be right back in just a couple of minutes with more Rebecca Johnson, Birmingham. Tons of fun. Stay tuned. Where I'm From is brought to you by Streen Studio. That's S-T-R-E-A-N-N Studio, the web app that puts you in charge of the live show. Stream Studio allows you to take your streaming game to the next level by allowing you to stream to multiple platforms at once. If you want to go to Twitch, if you want to go to YouTube, if you want to go to a website that isn't supported even, you can stream to all of those platforms at once, get feedback from your audience, and most importantly, it puts you in control of the show. Now, Stream Studio has several packages that work for just about any type of broadcaster. From the free plan, where you can stream with a watermark, all the way up to the gold plan, where you can have up to eight guests. You can stream to as many social platforms as you want. You can get a web link to share your show with external audiences. And you can even get an iframe so you can embed your live stream show directly into your website. Hey, I love Stream Studio so much, I'm using it to produce this show. I want to thank Stream Studio for supporting where I'm from. And you can give this fantastic software spin and support where I'm from at the same time. Just head over to our website at billmeeks.com slash where I'm from and click on the Stream Studio banner so they know we sent you their way. From the news center of Alabama, this is NBC 13 News at 6 with Mike Moore, Milena Wells, meteorologist Jerry Tracy, and Jim Dunaway with sports. NBC 13 News at 6 starts now. So, Rebecca, your first gig out of college was editing news stories at WVTM, a local station in Birmingham. Uh, Now, I've worked in news myself, and I know that newsrooms can be stressful places during big events. What was the story you kind of felt the most when you worked there? And did it turn you off from TV news? Oh, there are two things that uh, come to mind when uh, when you ask that really excellent question. Um, the first was when I was at WBTM, there was a hurricane that had hit uh, the Gulf Coast. It was called Hurricane Ivan. 15 years ago today, a powerful hurricane hit Alabama's Gulf Coast. Uh, you're looking at some of that video from a decade and a half ago. This is Hurricane Ivan we're talking mm-hmm. about. 
And this Stephanie eventually moved its way up and impacted folks in central Alabama too. It did. I mean, it moved inland as a very high end category three hurricane. Anybody that lived in central Alabama during this time remembers this. We had massive power outages the entire state. I think at one point over 1 million people were without power. And that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, the uh, I don't know what they're called, the local stations, general manager. The guy overseeing everybody. Yeah, I can't the, remember. the GM, general manager. Yeah. So the general manager, I think he had come from NBC or something. He thought he was, you know, the national news. He thought he was big stuff. So when he <laughs> came down, I don't remember his name, so I can't <laughs> I can't call him out. But he wanted us to go 24 seven. He wanted mm -hmm. us to be live 24 hours for Hurricane Ivan. And so yeah. we were sleeping at the news station. I had to take an extra pair of clothes. <laughs> it was it was a little ridiculous, I'm going to be honest. I yeah. maybe some people that maybe it benefited some people, but I thought it was a little over the top. Um but, but that I remember that being kind of stressful because we were all kind of on edge because we didn't sleep very well at the news station. And uh, so that was that was kind of stressful. And I, then I, I remember a, I was going to say I worked at a news station in Orlando, Florida, which incidentally, I believe is owned by the same company that owns the station <laughs> you worked at. But yeah, you know, we had probably once or twice a year, we had a hurricane issue where people would have to stay in and like my office would get converted into a like a bedroom with like two two or three couches so people could come in and crash for a couple hours. It, it, I, it can be intense in a news stage. I mean, it's nice because they bring in lots of food, you know, all that kind of stuff. But by the same token, a lot of people end up getting stuck at work for 36, 40 hours, 50 hours, something like that. Yeah, it's it's not it's not so bad. But like if you're not sleeping well, everybody gets kind of or on edge and mm -hmm. uh, it can lead to bad decisions or poor decisions in terms of like making mistakes. So that, that that's the downside of that. But hopefully we were a benefit to the people in the Gulf Coast of Alabama during that time, because that was a pretty big hurricane that affected a lot of people, including my family, w which had a beach house in Gulf Shores at the time. Oh, um, wow. So that was uh, it was funny when we uh, had the footage from Gulf Shores sent in to us. I was like, oh, that's our beach place. <laughs> so, so it was kind of it, it brought it home to be uh, sort of a personal thing. And then I remember uh, something that's really shameful, uh, a shameful part of my life because I feel really embarrassed about it. Ooh. So back in the olden days, this was 2004, I think mm -hmm. we were operating at a VTR machines. The kids these days probably don't know what <laughs> those are. Not a VCR, a VTR. Yes. A, a videotape recorder, I guess is what it stands for. Uh -huh. I might be wrong about that, but it was a VTR. <laughs> we had seven VTRs. And uh, they were DVC Pro, so we had these tapes. Mm -hmm. And in, in the news business, I don't know how if this was your experience, Bill, but uh, back then in the olden days, <laughs> we had to uh, edit all the the VOs or the packages, whatever it was, on the DVC Pro tapes, and we, you'd have it labeled on a like a sticker sticker label on the tape. Uh -huh. And then if you were doing ingest is what we called it because you were ingesting the tape into the VTRs and you would have to do it in a certain order based on the rundown so that it would be in order to when the news packages need to show up on air. <laughs> well, I was doing ingest that uh, I guess it was night, might have been a six o'clock, uh, like a really like a all eyeballs on this newscast at six o'clock where oh, probably yeah. most people got their news. And uh, I had misordered the tape somehow. I don't know Ooh. how it happened, but I put the wrong tape in one of the wrong machines and it threw everything off. And I tried to recover it and it just mm -hmm. became a total disaster. Like, I don't know if we had to, I can't remember what happened after that, but I remember the anchors on the air going like, what is happening? <laughs> like, I remember just being so mad at myself because I had screwed that. Like I had done that. I had done that many, many times before. And somehow that got messed up, messed up. And uh, so that was one of the things that I just had to suck up as an adult and be like, okay, that bad, terrible, embarrassing thing happened to me, uh, but maybe I'll learn from it and uh, try to use that as a character building moment uh, in my life. And uh, that's just how I try to see it now. But it was it was one of those like I may have cried after it was it was bad. You, you know, I, I hate to say this right after you said you cried, but you know, what's really funny. <laughs> um, 
you crying. No, I'm getting up. <laughs> I, I can but, laugh about it now. And, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, too. But you played uh, Leanne Snyder on my comedy podcast, The Fakest. A plate is very generous. But yes, who, who, <laughs> I was not aware of this aspect of your backstory where you had like this crisis, you know, in, in the newsroom. And that's exactly kind of how Leanne's story gets started. Is she has a complete meltdown and realizes she's not cut out to be an anchor while live on the air. So that's kind of that's another little parallel there between you and Leah. Good evening. I'm uh, I'm Leanne Snyder and I uh, can you back up the prompter? I uh, there is a new a tire. F- I mean, fire truck. Did she say tire? F- Ooh, I'm, I knew I shouldn't have done this. Cut her mic. Yeah, yeah. Leanne and I have uh, a lot of similarities, but uh, she's also kind of better than I am in a lot of <laughs> ways. So, uh, so uh, that that was a that was a time I remember very vividly. Is like, oh no, I have messed this up. What I, what do I do? <laughs> so uh, I I have noticed that you don't really work in TV news now and haven't for quite a long time. What was the big thing that kind of turned you away from it? It was the stressful aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I was. Um, not a full proper full-time employee when I was there. I there was some program that I was in that I was kind of basically a part-time paid uh, employee. I was doing it for the experience and the the resume building. <laughs> um, but I remember having to work. I had to do three people's jobs most of the time. I mm-hmm. would do ingest and then dial in satellites and do the editing and sometimes hop in on production. And it got to be where it was and this sounds silly uh, based on what I do now, (laughs) it was too much (laughs) for me at that time. And I remember being really stressed out about that. And it was, you know, because news is so, it's maybe not like they show it in the movies. I remember, I don't remember which news movie it is, but it had Joan Cusack in in it. But uh, there's a scene where she has to like run a tape down the hallway and to get it to get it on her i did that many times where i was running down the hall to get to a tape to be on air because it would be so late and sometimes that was not my fault it was i was waiting on other things from other people and i just remember being so stressed out about a lot of that and i just it it sort of turned me off on it i loved all of the production aspect of it despite my my screw-ups yeah and i really liked the people there i just it was too stressful for me well, it's like, you, you know, news, uh, they're really intense people. A- everyone I ever knew who worked in a newsroom, they really believed in the mission of journalism. They really mm. believed in, you know, their day to day of it. And they they really tried to be the best they could be at all times, which can be really stressful when you're right in the middle of it, because maybe you don't feel like going 120 percent today. But yeah, everyone around you is. So you have to go 130 just so you, you, know, you show <laughs> up in the rankings. Up, yeah. Rebecca, Birmingham is a city that is really big on food. Uh, What are your favorite places to eat in Birmingham? Yeah, so Birmingham has uh, just, I don't know when this started, but when I was in Georgia, all of a sudden they decided to have all these new restaurants come and be amazing. And so now that Mm -hmm. I've come back, to Birmingham. My brother has made it his priority in life to make sure that I go to all these really good restaurants because I'll <laughs> he'll ask me, like, have you been to this place? I'm like, no, I don't know where that place is. And he, he'll shame me for not having been there. And so then we'll make a plan <laughs> to go there. Uh, so he's been uh, introducing me to a lot of these places. And he actually told me recently that Birmingham is nicknamed the dinner table of the South. It is so well known for its food industry, which was started by this man named Frank Stitt. He um, uh, Mm -hmm. started these restaurants. One of them is called Highlands Bar and Grill. It's probably one of one of the most famous ones in Birmingham. Uh, Mm -hmm. Bottega is another one of his, I think. And it's pretty famous. And Chez Fon Fon. I really like because it's it's French food, uh, so I can go (laughs) and kind of indulge in the French side of my brain that I enjoy. Those are the famous ones. They're great. I appreciate them. Uh, But the ones that I found that I really love, there's a place called Batola, and it's an Italian place. For me, it has really great Italian food, pizzas. But I remember the last time I went, we had the most amazing charcuterie board. Ooh, I'm a fan of a good charcuterie board. I've got to come back for the charcuterie (laughs) board. If I don't eat anything else in the menu, the charcuterie board is the stuff. 
There's another place uh, called Helen, which is really uh, relatively new. They do like family style dinners and they have angel biscuits, which are these little square biscuits. And they'll mm-hmm. have um, them as appetizers. You can get them as appetizers with this like crazy butter. I don't know if it's like caramelized or something. Like there's something in it that just is the most amazing butter you're ever going to put in your mouth. And so mm. the angel biscuits with that butter is <laughs> is so good. It might as well be a dessert. It shouldn't be an appetizer. <laughs> it should be a dessert. And they've actually made um, angel biscuit ice cream. There was one time they Ooh. changed their menu a little bit. Uh, but mm-hmm. I get the angel biscuit ice cream and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. So the angel biscuits, if you go to Helen, get the angel biscuits. It's worth it. It's so good. Have you ever tried making the angel biscuits yourself? No, but I need to try that. They would not be as good as the <laughs> ones at um, Helen. Helen, I think the the key to that is that butter that they make. Uh-huh. Um, so if you don't, I mean, the biscuits are good, but that butter is so good. <laughs> uh, as far as types of cuisine like what types of cuisine would you say are quintessential to Birmingham the thing about Birmingham food is that the students of this man Frank Stitt the uh, the students and the the now restaurateurs who the students kind of had their own restaurants mm-hmm. they they do their own thing and they're so the the remarkable thing is that there's a lot of variety about what you can get here I mean there's a Greek festival a Greek food festival that happens Ooh. I think every October so there's that's fun, a, like one of those things downtown where there's like music and oh yeah food yeah and, yeah, yeah. All that stuff. so there's there's Greek food in Birmingham some gyros now there's so many different places when I was growing up we didn't eat out a lot if we did it was like Uh, the Olive Garden was like the fanciest place we had. (laughs) You know, there was this place called J. Alexander's that might be the the fanciest place you'd go, like Mm -hmm. for your homecoming date or something. And I speak from personal experience about that. I did go to (laughs) J. Alexander's for my homecoming date. The thing now is there's so many things to choose from. It's it's just, it's just blossomed into this big foodie place. Yeah. Um, So there's so much variety here that I I really couldn't answer that question for you. Rebecca, uh, we've come up to our first game and I'm very excited about this for two reasons. One, it's a new game I just came up with like an episode or two ago and it's okay. a lot of fun. And two, I completely forgot to put stuff in for it. So this is going <laughs> to be crazy. Improv. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. This is called Wheel, Wheel of, of Anecdotes. Anecdotes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a suggestion and then your challenge is to respond with a short anecdote from your her- hometown 30, 40 seconds, the shorter, the better. Okay, you think you can handle it? You you know I'm, I'm bad at improv. We did some improv on the fakest, and uh, I'm, <laughs> I was terrible at it, but I'll, get, I'll give them my best shot. Yeah, I remember that. It was the best stuff we did. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, the first word, car keys. Well, recently, just within the last couple of months, uh, I went to a function that I had to do video for, which was uh, in the Birmingham area. And I had thought I was trying to get something out of the console of my car. And while I did that, I dropped my keys unknowingly in the console, shut the console thing in the middle of the car, Mm. uh, stepped out, locked the door from my uh, from inside the car because that was just kind of habit at the time. I don't do that anymore now. Um, <laughs> but I shut the door and realized I had locked the keys in the car. And I was Ooh. like, oh no, I don't want to cause a scene by calling AAA or something and have them come out here with all these these people going into this event that I'm supposed to be a camera person for. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to suck it up. We're going to do the event. I'm not going to try to freak out that my my keys are stuck in my car. <laughs> and uh, I'll just deal with it after it. So I have a very good brother who came and picked me up uh, uh, later on that evening. And uh, mm-hmm. then in the next morning, I had AAA go out there and the keys were there. It was fine. I don't have a, a copy to my key. I probably should make one of those. Nice. Okay. Forest. So there's a place in Birmingham called Oak Mountain State Park. Mm-hmm. And I went there with some friends in high school just on a Saturday. We were just goofing around. We went hiking. We hiked up to this place that has a waterfall. And we did some biking. And then after uh, we had finished all of our activities and we were about to go home, my friend Nick said, uh, you have a tick in your ear. Ooh. And I said, oh, that seems like a problem. And he, <laughs> thankfully, he, w- he was an Eagle Scout. And he was like, I've... 
I, I'm a scout. I know exactly what to do. And <laughs> I trusted him enough to let him do this to me. And if it had, if he had not been an Eagle Scout, I would not have trusted him to do this. But the way you huh. get a tick out is you light a match and you put the match on the tick. Ooh. And then it detaches it somehow. So he lit a match. I, I think he I think he put it out. He lit it, put it out, and then put it up in my ear because it had embedded itself in in the like the part of your ear that's sort of hidden away. And he got that tick out. Uh, so that I guess had happened in the forest <laughs> while we were at Oak Mountain State Park uh, hiking around the uh, park. Newspaper. 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 That's that's a hard one because people don't really do newspapers any more the newspaper in birmingham is called the birmingham news it is now i think with all the digital stuff now uh i think it might be kind of in al.com which is where a lot of people Mm -hmm. get their news it's interesting i never wanted to when i worked in news i always wanted to be in the tv side i never wanted to do newspaper and have to write things out you wanted to be 70s Clark Kent versus all the other times. Clark Correct. Kent. <laughs> I wanted to be the Clark Kent that actually didn't make the most sense. Like, why would Clark Kent be on TV? What is what a stupid choice. Uh, <laughs> I love how he would like jump in his news van instead of a phone booth to change into Superman. <laughs> so, like, there are cameras in there, Clark. You're trying to hide a secret identity. What are you doing on television? Um, but yeah, so I think uh, it's it's always been kind of interesting to me that I never wanted to do newspapers because mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to write. I'm, I'm not yeah. a good writer. I don't, I only do it when I have to. I respect the newspaper people because they <laughs> they actually love doing it. Um, but it was just never something I was interested in. Uh, swimming pool. Oh, swimming pool. Uh, well, swimming the swimming pool. pool I grew up in was the Vestavia Hills uh, swimming pool that was associated with a walled park, which is in um, Vestavia Hills. And I remember going to swimming lessons. My dad would take Hmm. me. I think he would take me to my swimming lessons in the morning one summer. And then uh, he'd he'd get me sort of cleaned up. And then he would take, I think I was maybe five years old at the time, five, six years old. And (laughs) then he would take me to vacation Bible school. So I had this, (laughs) this really early swimming lesson. We would also go to that swimming pool when... Uh, when I was in high school, we had a band party uh, out there, and I was, uh, I was, I think I was the president of the band that year, my senior year, and nobody was getting in the pool. We had this pool party, and nobody was getting in. Nobody wanted to do it. So uh, <laughs> my friend Victor and I were like t- talking about how do we get people in the pool, and so we just sucked it up. And so Victor and I just hopped in the pool. We just jumped right in. <laughs> I love that anecdote because it says Rebecca Johnson is a is a strong, bold leader. And <laughs> that's what I know to be true. So, you know, somebody had to set the example. Yeah. Yeah. OK, one last one. And uh, this one, I, I'm going to challenge you to relate it directly to Birmingham. OK. Because uh, I know you'll have a million stories not related to Birmingham. <laughs> OK. Comic book. Oh, comic book. Well, the first time I remember seeing a comic book was at a local comic book shop in Hoover, which is one of those suburbs I was talking about uh, that's in Birmingham. But when I was nine or 10, the Dick Tracy movie had come out. One mm-hmm. of the one of my top five comic book movies uh, of all time. People are always <laughs> like, really? And I'm like, yes. Um, and it's, it's good design, good acting, good script, uh, good comic book adaptation I read when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's great. Right, good. Yeah. Wow, wow, what a and it's great soundtrack. Steven Sondheim, come on. Madonna um, as the... Breathless Mahoney. I, I was going to say something else, but that might be a spoiler. Yes, don't don't uh, reveal who she really is. No um, spoilers for the 30-year-old movie. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep that twist intact. But that movie had recently come out, and I was obsessed with it. I loved it. I had the t-shirts. I had the magazines. I had the trading cards. I had everything. And um, so I told my mom, I would like to get a comic book. Uh, The first comic book I ever bought was a Dick Tracy comic. And I remember going there with my mom and I got to pick it out. There were several ones that I could pick, but that was um, the the first time I'd ever seen a comic, ever owned a comic. Um, (laughs) And uh, so it was just, that was a real treat for me. And so that that happened in Birmingham that I was able to, to do that, that I found that I had a love for them. I believe one of the early comics I got was an adaptation of that Dick Tracy movie. Too. Oh. I don't think, actually, Rebecca, you're going to hate me for this. Uh, I don't think I've ever actually seen the movie, 
But I had that comic book adaptation. I read it like a million times. So I feel I know about the kid. I know about oh, yeah, yeah. the the Madonna reveal at the end, you know. <laughs> so I, I think you would really like the music. The lyrics are really clever. Mm -hmm. And I think you would yeah. appreciate that. Well, didn't uh, Stephen Sondheim worked on the music a little bit, didn't he? He did the yeah. lyrics, I think. I don't know if yeah. he did the music as well, but the uh, Stephen Sondheim is very difficult to sing. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I still listen to that, <laughs> that soundtrack because it's just the music is so good. I'm a huge Sondheim fan. I've only ever been in one show, and I didn't even I didn't get to sing because uh, my voice isn't good enough. I got to cry like a baby off stage. <laughs> That's totally fine. <laughs> Wheel of Anecdotes. Okay, well, Rebecca, uh, that ends uh, the Wheel of Anecdotes. And I want to let you know, you won big and I lost big because I forgot to prepare it. But Yay! I think it came out all right. I think it came out all right. Winner. <laughs> so are you enjoying the interview with Rebecca Johnson about Birmingham? Good, because there's a lot more of it. Come back next week for part two of our conversation. Thank you to folks for uh, joining the live chat room. Normally we uh, stream this live over at youtube.com. So I forget what the new things are. Search for Bill Meeks. Uh, they just changed up how they do those. I think it's at Bill Meeks LA. And over on twitch.tv at twitch.tv slash Bill Meeks. And if you like the show, feel free to go over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, rate it, like it, play the episodes, just hit play, walk away. It'll help our stats. And you can find uh, links for all of the episodes, things we've talked about in the show, all that over at billmeeks.com slash where I'm from. See you soon. Yeah.